I'm going to try to compress 45 years of research and experience into about 45 minutes. I have a big audacious goal to enable anyone anywhere to use what they have to pay for what they need or want without the need for any political currency that must be borrowed into circulation from banks that charge interest on it. In other words, I'm looking to liberate what I call the credit commons. I want to start by reviewing how we transfer economic value. Uh, we can provide a gift where I give you something without any expectation of anything in return. Or there can be a forced appropriation, theft, robbery, extortion. Most taxes fall into that category. Or we can have a reciprocal exchange, which is a voluntary exchange of goods and or services or other value uh, and we typically use money for that. Now, these are the only three ways that I can see of transferring value uh, from hand to hand, a person to person or corporation to corporation. Uh, reciprocal exchange by far is uh, the largest of these realms. And we typically use political fiat money in order to uh, manage those. But uh, what we're all working toward is innovative exchange mechanisms uh, that find better ways to do it. So we can do private currencies issued by producers. We can do direct credit clearing amongst buyers and sellers. And these will provide reliable sources of credit and supplemental payment media based on real value that's locally created. That's the ideal. Now, the basic concepts in currency, credit, and exchange, I want to uh, present in sequence here. And uh, we can discuss these later on if you have any concerns or questions or objections. Uh, what I've learned is that the essential nature of a currency is that it's a credit instrument. Uh, that is, it's a promise, a promise to deliver valuable goods or services at some time in the near future. And the sole purpose of a currency is to facilitate the reciprocal exchange of value that is in the market. Now, too many times uh, over the last 30 years, as people have tried to create local currencies and community currencies and uh, let systems and uh, types of that sort, uh, they have tried to load it up with too many extraneous objectives. But uh, a currency is intended and suited only to provide uh, reciprocal exchange of value. Quite often, people have tried to link uh, recently a guaranteed um, by launching a currency. But a currency is not designed to deal with the problem of how the economic product is distributed. A currency can only provide for the exchange of value. A reciprocal exchange, as I said, is a vol voluntary exchange of one sort of value for another in the market. Now this diagram basically will show what we're talking about here. So we've got three figures here. We'll start in the upper right with a business or municipal issuer of a currency. That currency is issued when workers and suppliers accept it in return for their labor or services or supplies. Now, of course, the, the workers and suppliers that receive the currency need to do something with it. They're going to want to get things that they need from the local merchants, so they're going to try to pass it on in return for the goods and services that the merchants provide. Those merchants can then circulate that currency amongst themselves uh, to transact business that they do amongst themselves. 
uh, before the currency is returned to the issuer in return for their goods and services. So this is the completion of the reciprocity circuit. And this is what needs to happen with, uh, with any currency. Since it's a credit instrument, it needs to be issued into circulation by a trusted business or municipal government that has something of value to offer to the rest of the community. So we have historic examples of this, you know, long before the current wave of local currencies took hold uh, back in the early to mid 1980s. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, there were hundreds of local currencies called scrip that were put into circulation by different entities, uh, businesses, municipal governments, uh, credit clearing houses. Some of them worked well and others didn't, depended on how they, how they were issued and who was behind them. Uh, the upper left shows a picture of a Larkin merchandise bond. Now, the Larkin had a number of retail outlets in the Western New York part of uh, the United States. And uh, they issued their merchandise bonds, basically a local currency, by offering it to their employees and their suppliers in exchange for employee labor and suppliers goods. This was to make up for the insufficient supply of dollars that were in circulation at the time. And uh, these circulated throughout the community and the Larkin company uh, accepted them back at face value for whatever merchandise uh, the holder of the merchandise bond wanted to buy. So that's a, a good model to be followed. To the right, we have Canadian Tire Money. The Canadian Tire Company has a number of retail outlets. They sell a lot more than just tires. And they are spread out throughout Canada. Uh, Canadian Tire Money was offered as a, as a rebate currency. Uh, basically, when you spend uh, a certain amount of Canadian dollars, you would get a, some Canadian Tire Money, some proportion of the amount that you've purchased. And in the lower left, we have uh, a number of uh, trading currencies that were issued in Argentina in the early uh, 2000s, uh, when the Argentine economy was in dire straits and uh, even mi middle-class, uh, well-educated people were unemployed because the financial system was breaking down. So a number of these trading clubs uh, popped up all over the place, starting in Buenos Aires and then spreading out. And uh, each club was issuing their own currency. And uh, some of these were well managed and others were not. So the basis of issue of a currency is uh, the goods and services that the issuer has available to sell. Uh, a currency must be issued on the basis of this value foundation. Uh, you can't just uh, issue a currency by fiat and expect people to accept it. Uh, they have to be uh, expecting of some value to be obtained uh, later on in return. So it's issued on the basis of goods and services that the issuer is ready willing and able to sell immediately or in the near future. And in the near future means uh, something like about what you have available to sell within the next two or three months. What about issuance? Uh, to be properly issued into circulation, a seller must have something of value to offer to another seller who accepts it as payment for their own goods and services. It is spent into circulation. Now, this is in contrast to so many of the local currencies that have been circulated in recent years that have been sold into circulation for dollars or euros or British pounds or whatever uh, fiat currency is dominant in that region. But 
to properly issue a, cur issue a currency into circulation, it needs to be spent into circulation. That means there is no involvement of uh, fiat currency. Actually, uh, it is accepted by another producer in exchange for their goods and services with the expectation that they will be able to redeem it later on. So this provides an alternative means of uh, exchange that the whole community can use as we saw in the diagram uh, before it comes back to the issuer for redemption, not in fiat, but in goods and services that the issuer has available to sell. So when a currency is redeemed, it is, it is extinguished. It goes out of existence. Uh, of course, the issuer can issue a new currency or reissue the currency if it happens to be a note on the basis of goods and services that are uh, readily available. So the question arises, uh, how much currency can a producer who issues the currency put into circulation? And this is a quote from E.C. Regal, who wrote a book called uh, Private Enterprise Money, which I highly recommend. It's available on my website, beyondmoney.net. Every person or corporation is entitled to create as much money by buying as he or she is, avail is able to redeem by selling. So this is a concrete example. Uh, you know, I made a proposal a few years ago uh, that electric utility company could issue solar dollars into circulation on the basis of their ability to provide uh, electric, electric services. So electric utility company might offer solar dollars to its employees, suppliers and contractors in return for their labor services and supplies. And then those employees would spend those dollars, uh, solar dollars, with the merchants and professionals and businesses in the community in return for the goods and services uh, that they needed. And again, we could see uh, solar dollars circulating throughout the community uh, for an extended period of time until they are returned to the electric utility in payment for electric services. So this would again, complete the reciprocity circuit and uh, it would be put into circulation by a trusted issuer who has something of value that many people want. Another basic concept is liquidity. What do we mean by liquidity? Liquidity is simply the ability to pay. It means having some medium that is acceptable to others as payment for the goods and services they have to offer. Now, of course, we're accustomed to using fiat currencies and we depend on the governments and central banks and the banking system to provide us with liquidity, but they are in full control of fiat currency. We do not have any control over that. Uh, the best that we can do is to try to acquire some of that fiat currency in the market by selling our labor or uh, engaging some business activity. Uh, another concept that needs to be understood is monetization. Monetization is the process of converting the value of an illiquid asset into a liquid form. That is a form that can be used as a payment medium. So banks do this process of monetization uh, by granting loans. Uh, if you go to a bank and you say, uh, I've got some real estate here and uh, I need some money. Can you lend me some money uh, by taking a mortgage on my property? So they will assess the value of the property and uh, give you a loan of some fraction of the value of that property. So they're monetizing the value of your illiquid real estate into a form that you can spend. 
uh, dollars or euros or pounds or whatever. So we can do the same thing. We can monetize uh, the value of our production. So every producer uh, should be entitled to monetize uh, the value of their products and services in the form of some local uh, producer credit or currency. Now, what is money and what's the difference between money and currency? Well, if you do a web search, you'll find a lot of uh, nonsense definitions and descriptions of the difference between money and currency. But uh, money has gone through uh, an evolutionary process over a long period of centuries. And, uh, you know, money initially was uh, basically gold and silver coins or other commodities that were used. And then money uh, was deposited with a goldsmith, which eventually became a bank. And the bank issued certificates of deposit or notes that were basically warehouse receipts that you could uh, circulate and that could be redeemed back for gold. And then we had the uh, fractional reserve system, which arose, the bankers saw that the people weren't coming for their gold very often. So they issued more uh, paper notes than they had gold to redeem. That was okay up to a point if there was good collateral behind those notes. But uh, basically money has become basically credit and that's all there is to it. Uh, the last link to gold was severed when President Nixon decided in 1971 uh, that US dollars would no longer be redeemed for gold. So money and currency basically are used interchangeably in my uh, presentation. Uh, I consider them to be one and the same. But you know the, the functions that money is supposed to serve, the functions that we all learned, a medium of exchange, store of value, and measure of value, uh, that's not correct. I discovered long ago that these are three distinct functions that need three distinct uh, mechanisms. Money or currency is strictly a medium of exchange. And to be honest, it must be the promise of an issuer who has something of value to redeem. So the proper basis of issue of any currency is the goods or services that to deliver immediately or in the near future. Thus, only providers of real goods and services are qualified to issue money. Much of the fiat money that's coming into circulation is really pseudo money. It's uh, equivalent to counterfeit, uh, which is not intended to be redeemed. So why haven't community currencies been more successful than they have? I alluded to this earlier, most are sold for political currency. So they put no new liquidity into the economy. Uh, basically, they are gift certificates with limited circulation, like many of the gift certificates that you can purchase uh, from major retailers like Walmart and others. Uh, their costs are high and compared uh, to the benefits uh, you know, we have many of the uh, pound, uh, local pound notes uh, in the UK, like Brixton pound, Bristol pound, Lewes pound, and others. These are all sold for uh, British pounds. So they don't put any new uh, liquidity into the economy. They are simply substitutes for uh, British pounds. And uh, they're not self-sustaining. Uh, they've all basically depended on uh, grant funding in order to get started. And uh, they don't generate sufficient revenues themselves to be sustainable. So going back to political fiat money, we need to distinguish how they are issued from how proper currency ought to be issued. 
in the modern economy, almost all of the uh, money takes the form of bank deposits. But how did those deposits come into being? We're told that banks take in deposits from savers and then lend out those uh, deposits to borrowers, but that's not the case. The Bank of England in their quarterly bulletin of a few years ago said this, whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. So the bank is not lending savers money, it's creating new money when it makes the loan. Another quote from a uh, governor of the Bank of Canada said the same thing. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credit is created. That's brand new money. Now, I discovered that early in my research back in the early 70s through a publication from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, which said, the actual process of money creation takes place primarily in banks. Checkable liabilities of banks are money, that is deposits in customers' accounts. They increase when the proceeds of loans made by banks are credited to borrowers' accounts. So basically it's saying the same thing that the previous quote quotes uh, said. So what we're trying to do uh, currently is we're trying to overcome centuries of error, conflict and destruction connected with the political money system. There's been a false belief that the money power must be centralized in the hands of the state. Now, bankers and politicians long ago joined forces to increase their own power and wealth This took the form of uh, the Bank of England joining forces with King William III in Britain back in 1694, when the Bank of England got the uh, power to issue banknotes into circulation by lending them out. And uh, in return, they gave the king the opportunity to spend as much money as he needed to fight war. So the interest in usury that's built in the money creation process creates an artificial deficiency of money available to repay the uh, amount of debt that must inevitably increase. So this interest burden is uh, something that I've talked about in my usury conjecture. So economic and political control become ever more centralized uh, in the hands of fewer and fewer people and democratic government has as a result been corrupted. Now, can you imagine having total control over the creation of money? That you can create as much of it as you want, that you can give it or lend it to whomever you want, spend it in any way you want, make people pay to get it by charging them interest, that you can take people's property when they are <laughs> unable to pay back the money that you borrowed. Well, that's the situation that we're living in today. Why are even the richest, most productive countries going ever deeper into debt? This graphic shows the growth in the US national debt from 1900 until 2020. Now it only goes to 2020. I wasn't able to find a, an updated version of the chart, but you can see how it has gone astronomical, especially since uh, oh, around the year 2000. And it reaches here a little over $23 trillion. But if you look at the current figures, going to the US debt clock on, online, it's gone to $31.2 trillion. That's as of a couple of days ago. 
and that's way off the chart here. The chart only goes to 25 trillion. And so we're way up, way above that. And it's just going astronomical. Now, why is this? You know, nobody believes that this debt is really a debt because it's never going to be repaid. It's simply a measure of the amount of value that the US national government has taken out of the economy without any intention of ever paying it back. That's the same as if a counterfeiter were to print $31.2 trillion of counterfeit money and spend it into circulation. Here's a famous quote from John Maynard Keynes, the noted econ economist of the 20th century. He said, by a continuous process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. The process encourages all of the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Franklin Roosevelt, who was president of the United States during the Great Depression said, the first truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. Well, that's the, that's the situation that we're in today. That is the essence of fascism, the ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other private power. Now, we thought we defeated fascism with the end of World War II, but we can clearly see that that's not the case. Now, I've written up a white paper called The Usury Conjecture, uh, which I've put up on my website. And in a nutshell, it says, the central banking interest-based debt money system that is dominant around the world today is neither stable nor sustainable nor fair. The creation of money based, based on bank lending with interest creates an imperative for debt to grow exponentially with the passage of time. That in turn forces artificial economic growth as borrowers compete with one another in the market to acquire enough money from the always insufficient pool of money to service their loans. But there are features that make political monies dominant. These features include the fact that they are widely accepted, both nationally and globally. The US dollar has been the global reserve currency for decades since the end of World War II. They're easily exchanged in foreign reserve or foreign exchange markets. You know, I can go to Britain and exchange my dollars for pounds or to Europe and exchange them for euros with little or no difficulty. They are recognized and supported by governments with legal tender laws <clears throat> and restrictions on competing exchange mechanisms. The public is habituated to their use, the true costs are, uh, so are obscured, just uh, as we saw with the US national debt chart. We overlook the fact that that expansion of debt causes continual inflation. And there's a general lack of knowledge that sound and effective exchange alternatives exist and can be implemented. But we have the power to take control of our exchange process. Every producer whose goods and services are useful and desired is quali qualified to issue a currency. 
And a producer may do that individually or in association uh, with other producers. And that can take the form of trade credits or currency notes that are fully backed by real value and are put into circulation interest-free. So we don't have that uh, growth imperative. Well, we've seen many private currencies put into circulation, as I alluded to earlier, and we've seen lots of community currencies circulated in the last 30 years. Going back historically to the uh, 19th century, in Europe, there were railways that issued railway money. They would issue railway money that could be redeemed for passage on uh, passenger trains. And uh, as I said earlier, there was depression era strip. Uh, we've had mutual credit clearing circles like the Veer Economic Circle Cooperative that was started in the midst of the Great Depression in 1934. Uh, we have commercial trade exchanges. There are scores of these operating around the world. We've had let systems, and many of these are still operating. How does a mutual credit system work? When we have producers associating together in a mutual credit clearing circle, we allocate credit to those that are qualified to spend before they earn. So the green smiley faces are issuing members. Black ones are non-issuing members. Uh, we make an assessment as to how much goods or services each member has to offer. And if there's a sufficient amount readily available to be sold, uh, that member will get a line of credit so they can spend before they earn. So an issuing member will start the ball rolling by buying something from another member. And then those credits can circulate throughout the association, but eventually the issuing member has to accept them back and gets a credit to his account. So it's simply a, a ledger system. When you buy something, you get a debit to your account. When you sell something, you get a credit to your account. So a member's account will fluctuate up and down. Sometimes it'll be in the positive, sometimes in the negative. So in 2005, I visited the Veer Bank in Switzerland and in Basel. And uh, I started looking into the history of the Veer Bank back uh, in the 1980s, actually. And I learned that uh, it was founded in 1934 when small and medium-sized businesses in Switzerland uh, who were having a hard time because of the dearth of Swiss francs that were in circulation, uh, they were looking for a way to continue business amongst themselves. So they started this credit clearing circle called the Veer Business Circle Cooperative. Now, the VIR has since become a conventional bank, and uh, the, uh, the credit clearing aspect has been de emphasized, but it still continues and uh, has about 60,000 members that clear about $2, $2 billion worth of trades annually. As I said, there are scores of trade exchanges operating around the world. These are commercial businesses that organize into credit clearing circles and they trade without money in circles. So to summarize, uh, to avoid problems in a currency or credit clearing system, you need a proper basis of issue. The amount issued must not exceed the basis, that is the available goods and services that can be sold in the near term. There must be no favoritism in allocating credit lines. There must be no difference in price between fiat sales and trade credit sales. And the users must be in control of the organization governance of the exchange. 
So we have a system that's controlled locally, but can be networked together globally. As I see it, the future of community and independent exchange is that it will become a significant force in people's lives when uh, it provides independent interest-free liquidity to local enterprises through networks of federated local exchange circles that subscribe to a set of standard protocols that assure the soundness and stability of each member circle and each circle's credits. Now I have a vision that I have encapsulated into a short video that I want to show you. This will take about seven minutes. I call it Vita, a worldwide web of exchange that's locally controlled, but globally useful. Introducing Vita, a universal transaction system for the 21st century. You earn credits when you sell, and you spend when you buy. Vita is the 21st century solution for managing your financial transactions. Vita is like a credit card, a debit card, a checking account, all rolled into one. Employers, employees, Merchants, consumers, Vita is for everyone. You own it, we own it. Vita is a mutual for benefit company. Vita is locally controlled yet globally useful. It's a way to pay and be paid. Vita is a mutual credit accounting system. Vita uses no national monetary unit. Accounts are kept in a stable, non-political unit of account called a VAL. Vita uses no national currency for payments. Payments are made using our own credit in a process called credit clearing. Your sales pay for your purchases. Using your Vita account. With your Vita account, you can make purchases, make donations, or transfer value to anyone, anywhere. It's just like writing a check or using your debit card. With your Vita account, you can receive payments for wages, salaries, sales, and other income, just like receiving direct deposits to your bank account. But with Vita, every member has an interest-free line of credit. That means that your Vita account can have a negative balance. Your spending and your earning do not need to be perfectly synchronized. You can either spend before you earn, or earn before you spend. Here is a typical checking account. Your account balance must always be positive, and negative balances are not allowed. In a typical credit card account, the balance must be paid in full at the end of each month to avoid interest and penalty charges. But with your Vita account, there's an ongoing difference between your receipts and expenditures. How does it work? Personal membership. Let's say your salary is deposited on Tuesday and you go shopping on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Your account begins at zero. You deposit your salary for 1,000, bring in your balance to 1,000. You buy groceries for 120, which brings your balance down to 880. You then make a car payment of 360 which brings your balance down now to 520. 
If you buy some furniture, spending 610 vowels, which brings your account now down to negative 90 vowels, and then you get your next salary payment for 1,000, which brings your account balance up to positive 910. With the business membership, sales are credited to your account, purchases and wage payments are debited against your account. Here are some hypothetical business transactions. Again, your account starts at zero. Your initial transaction is you buy supplies for 800 bells, so your account goes negative by 800. Then you make sales of 14,000, which brings your account balance to a balance of positive 13,200. Then you make your payroll payments to employees for 27,000, which brings your account balance down into the negative territory at negative 13,800. You make sales of 13,300, which brings your balance up still in the negative, negative 500, with additional sales of 11,400, your account balance now comes back into the positive territory at 10,900. The membership structure of Vita is a web of trust. Each member joins as part of an affinity group whose members vouch for one another and ensure each other's account balance. Vita is a holarchy of nested nodes. Individuals join groups, groups exist within clusters, clusters within companies, and companies within communities, and so on, from the local up to the global. Account balances are limited at each level, so risks are limited. Defaults are rare within a web of trust. Defaults that do occur are borne by all the other entities at that same level, thus isolating problems and protecting the network. Problem accounts are addressed in a timely manner, at the appropriate level. The harmonization of interests assures that all can be successful. The organization of VITA is a chaotic network, organized as a for-profit corporation governed by all of its members through their affinity groups. Vita is a worldwide web of exchange, locally controlled, but globally useful. Vita, it's where we want to be. So, we have a great opportunity, as I put it, it is time to reconceive the very idea of money, currency, and payment, and realize the full potential of community currencies and direct credit clearing between producers of real value. I want to end with this screenshot of uh, my website, Beyond Money. Dot net, and I want to call your attention to the menu items here. I've got recent articles in this pull down menu. I've got a library of uh, extensive research uh, materials, my own writings and other case studies, including the Veer and various other historical examples. And the sidebar has a list of all interviews and presentations that you can scroll. And these are some of the <clears throat> most important recommended references that I would uh, hope that you will consult. And now um, let's have some discussion. Thank you, Thomas. While I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking about the language we are using in uh, researching money. 
and in your title of the presentation, you say private money. Is it possible money to be private in general? And do you think that money is public in its essence? And uh, isn't it uh, a time to make a revision of our language, which are using in analyzing not only complementary currencies, but all the monetary issues? That's my question. Yeah, I, I think confusion often arises. It seems like Europeans and Americans especially have a different sense of what those words private and public mean. You know, we need, we need to be uh, civic-minded. Uh, we need to pay attention to uh, the common good. That's, uh, that needs to come to the fore. You know, there's been too much emphasis on narrow self-interest and, and private profit. So all of the work that I've been doing has been aimed at uh, trying to find ways to promote the common good. One, one of the problems, as President Roosevelt uh, alluded to in his statement that I quoted, corporations have gone out of control. It used to be that uh, corporations were given limited liability and other privileges in return for a, uh, for a project that seemed to have some uh, general benefit to the community. But they were limited time. Quite often, the charter was granted for maybe 10 years, also limited it could do. This limitation has been removed. And uh, since the, the corporations and the national governments, political interests have joined forces together to their own power, uh, that has been destructive to, to, to a democratic. So when I talk about private currencies, what I mean is uh, a currency that is not issued by a national government by fiat with uh, legal tender. You know, a private currency is privilege. So a currency has to stand on its merits. And that means the value that's behind it. A private currency can, as I said, by an individual producer, by an association of producers, or by some lower level of government, municipal government. The municipal government uh, must have some value that, uh, and municipal governments do provide services that are valuable and, and desired. So that's why I include them as a legitimate issuer. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Do you have um, any comments or questions to Thomas and his presentation? Yes, Christoph. Um, good morning, good evening, maybe for you, uh, Thomas. Uh, yep. I was wondering if you approach already the movement or alliance called Credit Commons Society, which... Yeah, sure, I'm connected. I'm connected with them. All right, because I saw a, a link between your, uh, your ID project, Vita, and them. And uh, for people who don't know it, Credit Commons Society is, uh, is kind of uh, an alliance between uh, Community Forge, uh, Community uh, Exchange, system ces based in south africa and mm -hmm. uh, mutual credit services i think it's based in uk so i just put the link on the zoom if you're interested in it so it was more yeah. common than a question but thank you for answering thank you <clears throat> yes please uh, hello uh, thank you for your presentation. My question is, in terms of uh, being uh, limited in supply and inflation, what do you think about the Bitcoin? 
And uh, does it fulfill your idea about the money? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, Bitcoin is a uh, virtual commodity. It's created uh, through uh, an embossed uh, work. <clears throat> it has all the characteristics of a commodity. And a commodity never serves very well as a medium of exchange because the amount of it is always limited. Uh, the ideal exchange medium is uh, credit because credit can expand uh, in, in step with the expansion of the production of valuable goods and services. Uh, Bitcoin being a commodity, um, at best it could serve as a measure of value. But even at that, I think there are better measures of value. I have proposed uh, for the last uh, 35 years that we can define a market basket of commodities uh, to define a, a unit of account that could be used as a measure of value that could value currencies as well as uh, goods and services. So we have to have an independent measure of value from the fiat currency that shows uh, when a currency is being abused, it will lose value relative to that objective concrete measure. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't see Bitcoin as playing uh, a major role. Uh, the uh, blockchain technology, on the other hand, uh, could have a role to play. Uh, that role could be in the form of creating tokens that would provide a secure means of uh, pass between different levels in the Vita um, system. You know, when you act between um, one circle and another, uh, you're sending uh, credits through the internet uh, to a different location to put on a different ledger. There needs to be a secure process for doing that. And uh, the blockchain technology might serve that purpose. Okay, please. Um, I have a um, theoretical question. <clears throat> so if uh, in the community money is issued, then there is a certain amount of money and, and this is perfectly described, but I think there's another component, another parameter, this is the circulation speed. And I think to control a system, general, generally spoken, you have to control all parameters if you like to control electricity, you need to control voltage and current. And yeah. do you consider this circulation somehow as well in your thoughts? Uh, yeah, of course. There has to be uh, uh, a healthy circulation. And that's why you don't overissue uh, to a, a producer that, um, that has only a small amount uh, of product to offer. Uh, so that's the first thing, is to issue in proportion uh, to the amount of goods and services uh, that are available uh, from the producer who issues. Uh, that's the most important thing. Now, commercial trade exchanges deal with this problem all the time. Uh, quite often they over-issue and they try up for it by using brokerage services. Um, helping people with uh, large positive balances to find ways to spend them and uh, helping people with large negative balances uh, to find ways to, to earn more. But uh, the first thing is to avoid over issuance in proportion to uh, each producer's available uh, product. Uh, the second thing is uh, if you're going to take a, a currency off ledger. Let's say you've got uh, a credit clearing circle and somebody wants to, somebody who's a member of the circle wants to buy from somebody outside the circle. Uh, they can ask the administrator to print up some vouchers uh, 
that he would draw against his uh, line of credit or positive balance and then spend those outside. Uh, and an outsider might be willing to accept those vouchers because they know that there's several hundred people within the circle, all of whom are obliged to accept the vouchers in payment for the things that they sell. So the way you deal with that is by putting an expiration date on the voucher to make sure that it comes back onto the ledger in a timely manner and doesn't stay out there forever. <clears throat> um, yeah, and I, I have a, a, a credit clearing algorithm needs to be designed that includes uh, anticipation of changes in a producer's ability uh, to produce and make value available to the rest of the network. So uh, yeah, the algorithm could take account of that. Okay, thank you. And yes, Ivo. Can you go a little bit in details about how you fight with inflation in the system you propose? Well, you know, inflation is caused by the fact that there's uh, fake money being put into circulation by the government and uh, by the banking system. Uh, I call it pseudo money. Uh, that's the cause of inflation. And uh, if we don't allow that in our system, if every unit of credit or currency that's put into circulation in our system is backed up by real value, there will be no inflation. Now, this gets us back to how do we denominate the credit? Uh, typically, commercial trade exchanges denominate their credits uh, in dollar equivalents or euro equivalents. And uh, that's, that's a, a matter of expedience because, uh, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where anybody has taken the initiative to define an objective universal concrete measure of value based on the market basket that I propose. But as long as we're not dealing in long obligations, we can live with that. If you spend your credits as fast as you uh, receive them, even if they're denominated in dollars or euros, which are being inflated, uh, you're not going to be terribly impacted by that. It's only when you have a long-term contract denominated in dollars or euros losing out. You know, right now I've got some dollars in a union account and uh, it's paying almost no interest and yet it's losing value because the, the dollar is being inflated and the prices of the thing that I have to buy are going up. So, you know, that's, that's something that we have to work on in, in the interim. You know, we can use dollar equivalents or, or euro equivalent equivalents. Uh, you know, that's the best we can do. Yes, Thomas, thank you. And one more last question, uh, Rolf. Yes, uh, Rolf Schröder from Germany. Hello, Thomas. Hello. Um, I have a question. I have a problem um, with your proposal. It's a very far reaching approach. And unfortunately, we're just a small group of people worldwide even. Um, what I see, and of course, it requires political action. Well, I see potential for real change is uh, in liaising with other initiatives. Uh, somebody mentioned the commons movement. Um, today we had here presentations uh, from Brazil uh, where I can see, okay, there's a liais liaison to the basic income uh, schemes. Um, could you tell me something in, in your work when I go to other activists in other fields and neighboring fields where there are any interfaces between your approach and something I could offer to people who work about the commons, about microfinance and uh, other issues in order to reach uh, with the objective to reach a critical political mass 
I think that would be uh, an important to develop also a political perspective out of what we are doing. Thank you. Yes, that's that's very important, you know, and I've been active in the field for 45 years, and uh, my work has gone beyond just the exchange process. Uh, but in recent years, I have focused primarily on that because I see that as a, a fundamental necessity in order to solve the rest of the economic problems. You know, the distribution problem, I think, is not going to be solved un until we have some honest uh, approaches to the exchange process. Uh, so, yes, there should, there should be uh, interaction uh, amongst all of these different activist areas. Uh, right now, we're too much in our own silos. And, uh, you know, the advantage of conferences like this is uh, the bringing together of uh, people that, that are engaged in those, in those various other areas. And uh, we need to find ways to harmonize our activities and to gain political power uh, to change what the governments are doing. Right now, the governments are totally out of control in terms of uh, input from the people. And uh, we're headed very rapidly toward the ro role of a, a global fascist uh, empire. I don't know what more I can say about that. I mean, you younger people, I think, are going to have to pick up the ball on that. OK, thank you, Thomas. And uh, is there any, any one question? or? just to finish today because uh, it was very hard <laughs> emotional and uh, thank you thomas we are going to go into contact with you after the uh, session and now we are going to take a rest for the day okay thank you i've enjoyed it it's been a great opportunity for me thank you very much bye-bye <laughs>